Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Peterson Museum. I'm Lee Diffie from NBC Sports, and uh, I have to say on a very personal note, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and at, a, at an event um, just this special, of this magnitude, so significant, particularly for the year of the 100th running of the Indy 500, the week of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Um, so many special things to talk about in the Verizon IndyCar series right now. Not only want to say good evening to you all here, uh, say hello to everyone and thanks for logging on to uh, IndyCar.com and everyone listening on IndyCar Radio as well. Not only is uh, this a great week because we're in California and Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, the year is special, as we know, because of the 100th running. But the IndyCar series, the Verizon IndyCar series, is kind of pulling another gear this year as well, going to new circuits. Phoenix returned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're going to talk to Scott Dixon about his victory in just a moment. Uh, Boston coming up, the return to Road America, so many positives. Over the last year, after, over the last two years, actually, television ratings up double digits. So there's some really good momentum to build on. But, of course, the centerpiece of that is about the 100th running of the Indy 500. And I'm not sure whether when you told your friends or associates or colleagues that this event was happening and you were coming and you were attending, but it certainly happened to me. People were saying, well, what, what is this IndyCar Legends? W what, is, what is it about? And it's really simple. Celebrating and acknowledging the top five in the history of IndyCar, the top five most successful, simply because we can. Because if you look at any other major sport around the world, and, and you name it, if you might be a tennis uh, person, you might be a golfer, you might be very much into NFL, uh, NHL, Major League Baseball, NBA, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to get the top five in that sport in the one room at the one time to be celebrated. But IndyCar can, and that deserves a round of applause. That's what tonight's all about. I was, um, I was in the hotel earlier today and I decided to, to just, you know, get online and have a look at, you know, we all think we know the definition of legend and, and I'm as guilty as the next person is using it all too frequently and typically, um, you know, you might describe your friends, whether he or she, you say, oh, they're a legend, maybe because they're a good person or they're generous or whatever, we're, we're kind of perhaps a little bit too liberal in the use legend and there are, there are multi-stages of the definition of legend. And the first one that really struck me was a non-historic and unverified story handed down by tradition. Well, there is nothing unhistoric or unverified about the group that we have here tonight. It is truly special. And we've all walked around tracks and paddocks and events, all of us respectively, for many, many years, just dropping names like Foyt and Andretti and Ansa and Dixon, like it's, yeah. But tonight that yeah stopped, and we really say yeah, and really let it sink in to what these guys have achieved and their accomplishments throughout their careers. An amazing group of gentlemen, an amazing group of drivers, completely different backgrounds and upbringings and the range of age with this group of legends, from 35 to 80, from New Zealand to Texas, Amazing stories, amazing characters. Are you ready to see them? Yeah. With 39 career wins, and he got that 39th career win just two weeks ago in Phoenix, a four-time IndyCar Series champion, and he captured that Verizon IndyCar Series title last year in Sonoma in spectacular fashion, and he is the 2008 Indianapolis 500 winner. Ladies and gentlemen, from Target Chip Ganassi Racing, the only current driver out of this group of legends, Scott Dixon. Good evening, Scott. Good evening. I asked you before, and this, um, this kind of Took, took me aback a little bit because I don't often hear you speak this way and perhaps those who know you closely don't either. And I said, I'm, re I'm, I'm really pleased for you to be in this group and it's going to be a special night and you've, you deserve it. You deserve to be here. And you said, thank you, 
it's a little daunting. It is. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I feel very privileged and very lucky to to race cars for one, uh, but to be with you know this group and and tonight's just it's been so much fun actually just you know sitting upstairs and and uh, we all sat and had dinner together and and just you know uh, conversing, telling stories and. My stories are a little different to theirs, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it uh, yeah, it is daunting. But you know, it's um, you know, it is very special and, and something I need to learn to embrace. And, and uh, I just you know feel privileged to be able to do what I do, achieve what I have done with uh, with the team you know that Chip has, and, and uh, hopefully we can go on to uh, achieve a little more. Well, we got a lot more to talk about, and we're going to keep bringing up your fellow legends. Also on 39 career wins, four time. IndyCar Series champ and a four-time, one of only three, four-time Indianapolis 500 winners. Big Al is here, Al Unser. <laughs> Al, we spoke a little bit earlier tonight um, over dinner about the significance of this event for you, but if you would, just tell the group briefly about the significance of IndyCar to the Unser family name. Well, it's really, you know, for the Unser family, for Indianapolis, it, it was a gift every time, except when my brother won. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that Bobby cheats. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's really great, you know, to have the gathering we have here tonight and, and the group of drivers that we have, it, it's, it's an honor being here. And that's the theme that's going to continue throughout the night as we welcome up our next legend with 42 career wins. We just keep sneaking up that wins ladder, the 1991 IndyCar Series champion. Would you please make welcome, a big warm welcome for Michael Andretti. Thank you. Michael, good evening. You've got some amazing stories to tell, whether it be as a driver, as an owner, uh, as a, an Indy 500 uh, winning owner, team owner. I mean, you've seen it all. You've pretty much done it all. How have you seen the sport of IndyCar racing evolve over your time in the sport? Oh, God. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much it's changed since, you know, when I started. And, you know, I remember my father saying the same thing when he started, you know, and... Uh, you know, you look at the race cars that I that I drove. It was like I can't believe I drove that. You know, and uh, you know it's amazing how far the sports come, safety-wise and just uh, technology-wise. It's just uh, it's it's truly amazing. Exciting times, and a man who uh, can't hide his passion for the sport of IndyCar has ten more wins than his son at 52 career wins. Just had to rub that one in there, Michael. Thank you. Four. <laughs> Four times an IndyCar Series champion and the 1969 Indianapolis 500 winner, a man who is a household name all around the world, Mario Andretti. <laughs> you said you were going to pay me for saying that extra 10 wins. We, we, can, we can deal with that You'll later. You'll get it. You'll get it. One of, the th one of the things, Murray, and, and we have spoken about this a lot, and I've heard you talk about it a lot, is your immense sense of pride in Indy the IndyCar way. And the IndyCar way is that diverse way of the drivers have to bring their range of talent on the range of tracks. What does it take to be an IndyCar champion? Versatility. And uh, this is uh, what IndyCar enjoys, uh, or actually... Uh, the like I said all along, the IndyCar champion is the most complete champion in motorsports today because of the versatility required to be able to be that at the top. Uh, you have to be at the top of your game in the short ovals, super speedways, street courses, road courses, and, and natural road courses. So uh, no other discipline provides that. So th that's where the pride, pride is. And for the individual that accomplishes that, it's also the ultimate satisfaction, quite honestly. And, uh, and this is something that, um, uh, that's where I put the value of my championships there. Um, and I've been very fortunate, but uh, uh, that to me was always the shining moment uh, in my career. 
Well, you may notice, you don't have to be too observant, that there are only four chairs up here instead of five. <coughs> AJ Foyt, unfortunately, uh, recently came down with a pretty severe bout of the flu. And AJ sends his apologies. We were able to send a, uh, a film crew out to, to shoot an interview with him uh, several days ago. But before we get to that, we have to give him exactly the same treatment as the other gentlemen, the other legends, with 67 career wins. And the question begs, will that mark ever be reached? Will that record ever be broken? Seven times an IndyCar Series champion and four times an Indianapolis 500 winner. He might not be here with us tonight, but he deserves a huge round of applause for Supertex, AJ Foyt. This, this also means he's not here to defend himself, so you can, you can, you know. Yeah, you know, $50,000 appearance money wasn't enough for him, you know, so, so, so that's what it was. Getting back to that, to the, uh, to the video for, for AJ, a, um, a, a film crew went out and uh, asked, asked him a variety of questions. So this first one was, uh, it's an epic year, 2016, of course, featuring the 100th running of the Indy 500. Does this year's Indy 500 have special significance for you, AJ? Yeah, it really does. I never thought I'd live this long to see it, so I hope I make it. The way my life's been the last two or three years, and it been kind of shaky, and just like now, I come down with the flu, I guess, a couple of days ago, and I never have that, but I've been sick. I hope I can get out for the Long Beach race, and much less in the end. Last year, I did make Indy after my heart surgery and all that, but then I kind of went back downhill, so this is hope. I'm, I'm getting better every day and stronger. Resilience, resilience like very few have. Second question that was put to, to AJ was, you've always been proud of your family roots. How important has it been you to stay close to your home state of Texas? I was born in Houston, Texas, right here where I still live, uh, in St. Joseph Hospital on 1935, January 16th. I'm, I'm probably one of the few. I know when I started racing, wherever you had to do, you had to be from California. I know that. and. Uh, I've been in California a lot and raced in California, but I've always had my family here in Houston, and I just didn't want to move out of Texas. I've been a Texan all my life. I'll probably be, remain a Texan until I die, but uh, I was born right here, and this is where I plan to stay. They're very proud of that. Of course, he uh, is renowned for his, you know, Mario was talking about versatility, and the next question put to AJ was racing in different disciplines, Indy cars, stock cars, sports cars, what does it take to win in each of these categories? I think everybody's got different feelings of a race car. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people ask me, how did you jump from Indy cars to stock cars and sports cars? I think you have to be born with that. I don't think you can make yourself if you're going to be good. I think that's a talent that you've got to be born with. Interesting thought there. The next question was, what makes the Indy 500, winning the Indy 500, different from all the other race victories in your career? And that's what made A.J. Foyt, was the wins at Indy. I won a lot of great races, don't get me wrong, but Indy's like a Kentucky Derby. You can have not maybe the best horse, but if you win the Kentucky Derby, everybody knows that. And that's where Indy on tradition stands out. If you win it, the world knows it. So true. Tonight, of course, for the five gentlemen is about being an IndyCar legend, the legend's evening. Next question the film crew put to AJ was, does he consider himself a legend? Well, the biggest thing I can say back in my day, and there's a lot of great, great champions and race drivers, I've always said I'm glad to be named amongst them. And uh, that's what I've always been proud of. Not that I was any better than any of them, but to have my name amongst the greats. Obviously, and competing this weekend uh, is AJ Foyt Racing. Now a team owner, still has sights set on winning. How does AJ coach his drivers and what makes a champion? Well, actually, how to find a champion is you gotta work at it and you gotta run good all day and get there first. And if you get the most wins, you're gonna be the champion. So. That's how you win the championship, is being consistent and 
you know, getting points at every race, and some race you're going to win, some race you're not. So that's the biggest thing, being consistent. All right, Mr. Dixon, you're listening to, you better listen to this next answer, OK? One of our, the, next, the final question put to, to AJ Foyt was, one of our guests this evening has another shot at an IndyCar championship or and another Indy 500 victory. What are your thoughts on Scott Dixon and his winning record? Well, I respect Scott Dixon. I've been watching him since he came over and he's driving for Chip Ganassi. He's a good race driver, a great race driver, and, you know, all of a sudden he's not in the running, and all of a sudden you look back and he's in the lead. So he's a great race driver and very smart. So he kind of stands out over the other ones. <laughs> How about that? That was cool. That's very cool. For you, um, like we said, very diverse range of upbringings here and, and uh, stories to tell. What is, and, and this night's not just about AJ, but we've got to give him his due because the rest we'll discuss with you guys. What does AJ Foyt mean to you? Uh, so many things. I think, you know, there, there's so many uh, classic memories of, of AJ that, that everybody has, but, you know, ones that stand out, you know, for me was, you know, him whacking his car with a, with a hammer and, you know, then getting in the thing and trying to drive it again. You know, it, uh, through, the, through the eras, it's changed so much. And, and you know, it's for someone that actually worked on their car, raced the car, you know, to slappy, you know, slapping Ari in the face, um, <laughs> you know, there, there's so many classic, uh, you know, AJ stories. Um, but it's all about the passion. It's about what he loved. He loved motor racing. He loved IndyCar. He loved the diversity of different series. But... The common thing was that he won in everything, and uh, you know, to me, you know, AJ is, is definitely a true legend. The stats themselves, uh, you know, say that, and, and uh, you know, it's it's really cool to you know, last week when we run in, won in Phoenix, uh, you know, to be presented the AJ Foyt Trophy uh, by AJ was was you know very special, and and uh, the special part was, you know, standing back behind. Um, you know uh, the podium there, and, and just you know chatting to him about racing, you know, and and you know how things were, you know, when he was racing and to what we, you know, had that night and, and what he loves, you know, still with this sport. Michael, your views on AJ and did you view him when you, when you were younger purely as a racer or was your view distorted by his battles with, with your dad? He was the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, growing up I wasn't allowed to even say anything good, anything good about AJ. <laughs> but, uh, but as I got older... Uh, <laughs> As I got older, I got to know AJ, and I, I really like him. I got a ton of respect for him. Um, he's an honorary old bugger, and and he just uh, loves what loves the sport, and and you know has been a part of it for a long time, and has helped helped to get it to where it is today. And uh, you know he uh, he's a unique guy. Al, for you. Oh, that'd be a long story. <laughs> I guess Mario and I are the only ones that ever raced against him up here. I raced against him. Did you race against him? Did you ever have to run from him? No, no, no. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> you didn't really race against him, did? <laughs> but he's just a—he was a terrific man. He still is. He—he he loves racing. And if he was here tonight, we'd have to look at him and. And we would have to honor him as as we do, you know. He he uh, he was one guy. There was about three or four guys on the USAC trail that I never wanted to tangle with, and he was one of them. And in a dirt race one time, Mario I think hit me in the back, and <laughs> <laughs> we get kind of sideways, and I hit for it. And then I finally get around, and, and when I finally get back around to the pits, here's Foyt standing there waiting for me. <laughs> I mean, you talk about a gorilla. <laughs> so I just looked up at him, and I says, my car is bent. And he looked down, and he says, okay. And he turned around and walked away. But he, he's, a, he's a fantastic race car driver, and his record speaks for him. Mario, this is a natural for you to pick up. <laughs> well, uh, when I broke into the uh, IndyCar ranks, uh, uh, Foyt was already there for five years, and he was the yardstick at the time. I'm, 
if you wanted to win any race, you had to go through him. I had to deal with him somewhere. And uh, quite honestly, uh, that's really the way that um, I looked at it. I felt that uh, uh, he's, he's going to have to raise your, he would raise your game because uh, 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 he, no matter where, what type of track you were on, uh, he was right at the top. So uh, I always said, uh, you know, if you win a race with Foyt second, it's a great day. But if, even if you run second to A.J. Foy, it was also a good day. So uh, it was that type of a thing that, uh, that he, he, he carried. Uh, he had so much, uh, uh, I don't know if you say control, but uh, domination, you know, the sport in, in those days. And uh, it's because, uh, again, you know, he just, uh, he, he had so much passion and love for it, which uh, was inspiring for all of us, uh, especially us younger, uh, young guys coming in. He didn't like any of us, obviously, because then we turned out to be a little bit of a thorn on his side, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and the only thing that uh, I had never worried about is because I could always run faster than him. <laughs> you, know, <but> <laughs> you could just run under him, you know, so. <clears throat> but um, again, what a, you know, the real character, and, and again, uh, uh, when it comes to Indy cars, um, uh, you know, he, he was there for a long time, and um, he was one of the lucky ones like ourselves here that uh, uh, we were able to dodge a lot of bullets, you know, at a time where there were a lot of bullets thrown at us, you know, because of uh, the fact that, you know, the sport was not enjoying the, the safety that uh, it's enjoying nowadays. And, um, and because of that, uh, we had the blessing of being able to, you know, put together some... Uh, some good results, good wins, and, and have a, a lot of ex, you know a lot of racing together. Uh, so again, it's um, um, it was you know one of the it was certainly one of the very top that uh, any of us had uh, the fortune of racing against. Al, this evening is is all about recognizing and celebrating all five of you as true IndyCar legends, the top the top of the tree. Your record will stand for many years to come. Your accomplishments will never be forgotten. Young people will look at you as a legend and as a benchmark. But when you were a young guy coming up through the ranks, who did you want to be like or who did you want to beat or what was your yardstick? Who were you looking at? Okay, here we go again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those deals. You got heroes, you know, and AJ was one of them. Jim McAreeth. I mean, I could sit here and name off 30 people very, very quickly that we raced against in, in over the years. And I used to look at them and say, boy, if I could only, you know, run with them. And I mean, it, it, it's something that you, I think, dream about. And then all of a sudden, one day, you're running against them. And the next day, you're sometimes out running them, very seldom. Because, you know, and it just makes it great to be able to be in that class of, of one day looking and, you know, and saying, you know, this is the way it is. And, you know, 50 years ago, if somebody had asked me if I was going to be here for the 100th running of the Speedway, I'd have laughed at him. I'd have said, well, I hope so, but I don't think I'll make it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and here we are. And it just, it's an honor. Really, Michael, when you when you hear the word Indianapolis, what what thoughts, feelings does it evoke? What is what is simply the name Indianapolis mean to you? Uh, I think if you're an IndyCar driver, it means everything to you. You know, I think um, you know, growing up, it was a big part of my life. I mean, spending many years there at the Speedway, and uh, um, you know, it's just. Uh, it's something that uh, every driver wants to do and wants to, to compete, but then everybody also wants to win. And I've been very fortunate to have a lot of great races there and, and uh, unfortunately never won it, but uh, you know, it, uh, it's a truly special place. It's our, it's our sacred ground. Scott, just last weekend in the golfing world was the Masters at Augusta National. You'll hear any golfer talk about when they first step on whether it's their first time there or they go back for their first practice round, it's that hallowed ground, it's that feeling. Is it the same for you guys? And even though you've lived in Indianapolis for many years with your family, when you go back to the Speedway for real, is it the same feeling? 
Yeah, it is. It, it, uh, as Michael touched on, it, it has a special feeling, um, you know, just going through the tunnel, you know, uh, coming through, seeing the pagoda, seeing, you know, the sheer size of, of the facility is daunting. And I was lucky enough in, in 2002, 2002 uh, when I first joined the CHIPS team to go as a spectator and, and take in that atmosphere and, and not have the stress and stuff of, of being a driver or competing there. Uh, you know, for the weekend, but to take in that side of it, I think was was really special too. To you know, see the atmosphere, see the crowd, uh, and just and and just witness what that race is really about, and then uh, to witness it the following year in 2003 as a driver, go through you know the ceremonial, you know whether it's the parade or, or the tradition that 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 place has had going on. It, it's it truly is just an amazing place to be a part of, and and living in Indy uh, now since. 1999 it's 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 so fun to see you know the city change and and the city embraces it and and jumping in a uber or a taxi and you know the drivers you know been going there for 40 50 years and generations have been going there it's such a just so many special stories for individual people not just the drivers but everybody involved maria what do you want from the hundredth running this year what are you hoping for what would you like to see what are you expecting about this grand event oh that's easy um, to see my grandson Marco win it, <laughs> it, would, uh, it would make up for uh, a lot of lost ground that uh, both Michael and I had, uh, even dominating that race, uh, had having it in our pocket except for just uh, very few laps at the end there. But uh, again, uh, he's poised for it, and of course, uh, as a family, uh, th there would be no better result, as you can imagine. But uh, it's going to be grand, no question about it. Um, you know, uh, there's no other sport that I can think of, uh, maybe offhand, that uh, probably c can celebrate a hundred, a hundredth anniversary, uh, and uh, and so strongly. Uh, you know, Indianapolis. Uh, you know, I'll talk about the value of the of the race. To, uh, argue, arguably, that's the only race on this planet, on any discipline, that uh, is worth a championship. You know, and uh, sometimes it tees me off that, uh, you know, when I'm introduced, uh, I, I won total seven different championships, including the world championship, and then I'm introduced as the 1969 Indianapolis winner. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 but um, but uh, that's the value that it carries. And, uh, and from a driver's standpoint, uh, they were talking earlier that uh, uh, just you win it, just winning it, it just lifts a big, huge weight off your shoulders, you know, because you've got to get that out of, out of the way because somehow your career is judged on your performance there. And it's grossly unfair from a driver's standpoint because many champions that uh, never won it, you know, were worthy champions, but they never won it, you know, and I think actually Michael being one of them, you know, he, as many times as he dominated there. so. Uh, but that's the way it is, and uh, but we have that going for us, and, and every year you just look forward to that opportunity, you know, to put that uh, under your belt, and, um, and I know how everyone feels, you know, that's got, uh, again, the value to, is golden, uh, you know, for us, and, and it's the only race uh, throughout the season that you get a chance to spend uh, three weeks there, you know, and uh, work toward it and uh, just really fine tune everything, every aspect of it. And, um, and so again, um, yeah, it's, that's the place, that's our Mecca for sure. And Al, when you, when you hear the Indy name, what is, it, what is it, you know, obviously it can trigger some tremendous memories for the victories, but how deeply does it resonate with you? Well, the first time I ever went there to Indianapolis and walked in there, I looked at all the big grandstands. I says, there isn't enough people in the world to fill all these. <laughs> I mean, the place, it, it just gives you a, a feeling that's unbelievable. And it really does. I think all of us sitting up here can say that, that when you get the green flag, you hope that you can last long enough to get that checkered flag and you hope that you're in the right position to hang it on your wall. And it's just an honor, you know, again, to, to see that checkered flag waved at you and you know it's you 
and I'm telling you, there, there isn't a feeling left in the world that will surpass that except when my boy run there and, and won, when Al Jr. won. I mean, I run third that day and I thought I'd won the race. And I run second a few times and I was mad. And all of a sudden I run third and I was happy. And I said, boy, that shows you what your family does to you. <laughs> now, Bobby is another story. <laughs> Scott, for you, can you, um, uh, can, can you believe that you're actually going to partake in the 100th running of the Indy 500? Is that somewhat surreal? I hope that's the case. You've still got to qualify, right? <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, I think it, you know, for the ones, for the 33 of us that do, you know, we're, we're very fortunate in, in, in just being in the right era, the right timing, you know, the, the significance of the event. Uh, it's going to be very special, but, but um, you know, as many of these guys have said, it's an honor to do that race. You know, it's, it's, it's such an amazing event, and, and to be, you know, this you know, very select few that, that, that can compete on that day, and all of us are going to be trying, you know, as hard as possible to, to, you know, be the one that wins the hundredth. You know, that that definitely adds, you know, some some bragging rights to it this year. But, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy just with how timing works and and how it, uh, you know, as I said, hopefully uh, we qualify and and uh, hopefully it's the number nine target car that that, that uh, gets to take victory. No offense to Michael <laughs> and Mario there. <laughs> Michael, for you, obviously Scott's an active driver. You're an active team owner. How about for you, being an owner in the 100th? Well, uh, it's been great for me being an owner. Um, you know, uh, to be able to say that we've won three, three races there at Indianapolis uh, is, is something very special. Unfortunately, I never won it as a driver, like we said, but uh, it was really special to win it as an owner. And, uh, you know, we are really looking forward to this, this month of May coming up. I think it's just going to be a huge event. And... What I'm hoping is we're going to be bringing in a lot of fans that maybe have been away and now they're coming back again. And I'm hoping that they stay and they're going to be there for the 101st running. So that's that's the whole goal, I think, for all of us. Mario, tonight um, I think is very representative of, of the way and, and the vision and the stance uh, that the Verizon IndyCar Series has with the 100th. Is this a pivotal moment for the series? I mean, this is about, like tonight, is representative of embracing the past but also looking to the future as well. Is that what the 100th is going to do for the sport? Uh, <clears throat> the 100th anniversary is in really good hands, quite honestly. Uh, I have said this uh, for quite some time, that um, the IndyCar series right now is enjoying probably as good a product as ever, as far as the depth of talent, you know, quality of teams. Uh, it's just, uh, again, uh, I think um, a lot of it is probably not, Maybe uh, we maybe we don't brag about it enough, you know. You have uh, I'm looking around at champions. Uh, you got many past champions, you know. Like I see Danny Solomon, you see Bobby Ray Hall, you see Parnelli, but then uh, you see uh, Dario Franchitti here. Uh, what he has accomplished also in the all-time series, and uh, and then of course Scott. Uh, so and and these dudes are really quite young yet so uh you know many more records i think will fall you know which again uh, it, it gives you um uh, it's a testimony of uh of what the, the the you know the quality of the series that we have and and again you know for the 100th anniversary you're probably going to be uh, probably going to have, have the best talent uh there that we've ever seen and that's what we have to look forward to al you were telling me a little bit earlier that you used to kind of wind up AJ about his record and records are meant to be broken, your level on 39 victories with the gentleman beside you. How do you feel about him? There's a pretty good chance he's going to surpass your, your 39 victories. <laughs> I'm lost for words now. <laughs> records are made to be broken, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just... It's, Indy is, is the race that you want to be at. It's the one that, that when you win it, it carries you the rest of the way. In other words, you can walk in someplace and somebody says to you, I understand you're a race car driver. Yeah. Did you ever run Indianapolis? Yeah. Did you ever win? 
Yeah. <laughs> so how many times? I says, four? No way. <laughs> so it just shows you, you know, what that place does. Yeah. It has a magic to it, and sponsors love it, people love it, and you'll see again this year, the hundredth year, I'm just glad I'm here, you know, to be able to enjoy it with you. And I hope that whomever wins it, Scotty, Michael's team, Mario said he might come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big might. <laughs> but I'm know, not. He was really pissed at me when we announced uh, Townsend. Huh? He thought he was going to be the guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the heck, I'm always in a play. You know, that, <laughs> yeah. you know just a, he says, uh, you know, they ask him how uh, many times you win, and he says, four times. Oh, my God. I said, uh, when they asked me how many times you win, and I said, once, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what about the, um, what about the, the cu current depth of talent? I mean, you know, it, it's very easy to talk about, you know, in your dad's days with Al and, and AJ, et cetera. I mean, I can remember, you know, and was an avid fan uh, yourself and Paul Tracy and Jimmy Vassar and that era. Now we've moved on to... You know the the uh, the Dixon and TK era, etc. Um, how deep is? I mean, I remember Dario saying this several years ago. He said this is the toughest series in the world purely because there's there's no pretenders all the way down to 23rd or 24th. You know, I think all the way down, all, all the way through to 33rd. You know, I think this year the talent is just amazing. Um, I think every one of those drivers that are going to be competing in the race um, have won something you know, in, in their racing career. And, and I think, uh, you know, they all can have a good day and actually still win the race. You know, a 33rd driver could still win that race. So it's uh, the depth of talent is as good as it's ever been. Um, I think uh, the depth of team talent as well is, is, is as good as it's ever been. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be bode well for, for 100 runs. Mar Mario, if Scott raced in your era, how competitive would he be? The same, no question about it. Uh, I've said this many times, and that question has been posed to me, uh, uh, you know, just uh, over the years. And uh, I always said the champions of yesterday will be champions today and vice versa. No question about it. I think there's something very special about individuals that can achieve at that level. And it's all about uh, taking 100, 101% out of that car, the machine that you're driving, and, um, and you know, obviously there, uh, you know, depends what that machine can give to you, uh, but as long as you can take everything that it's got, then that, that, that's all that's asked of a driver, and, uh, and again, that's, uh, there's no such thing as uh, uh, the champions of yesterday were more courageous, were more this and that, no, there's no such a thing as that. Um, I think it's the quality required is the same. And Scott, if you could turn back time, would you love to have taken a shot at these guys on the biggest stage? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I don't, I don't know about AJ though. Probably, I'd, I'd be like you running away from AJ. But, but uh, yeah, you know, the, the, I think the generations of cars that we've seen, you know, and the, and the spectacular transformations that we've seen with technology. Um, but, you know, there's so many classic and cool cars that, that yeah, you would have loved to have been in that era racing those cars and, and you know, along those lines. But uh, it is what it is. And you talk about, you know, the evolution of the series, and, Michael, you, you touched on it before, just how far it's come. Safety's a big concern, you know, as it always has been and it always will be. How far, has, how far Michael, has the, the series come with that, in your opinion? Oh, I think amazing. I mean, from the cars to the racetracks to the... the just the equipment that you wear. Um, I think the sport uh, has done a tremendous job over the years to just make it safer and safer. I don't think there's anything, I don't think it, it's, it's possible to have 100% safety, but I think, uh, you know, as a series, this, this, this series does everything they can to try to get to that 100%. Al, what do you think of the, uh, the modern day IndyCar? What do you think cars of 2016? Do they impress you? Uh, yes, they do impress me very much. In other words, they're a very fine race car. I think they got too many wings on them. <laughs> they're trying to—they're trying to fly where they're not supposed to be. <laughs> and but 
you know, again, it's, it's the rules committee make the rules and the owners have to abide by them and the drivers have to figure out a way to drive them. And that's, what the, that's why he's got the talent. And uh, I don't know about Mario, he doesn't have any talent anymore. <laughs> Mario and I are in the same boat. We we're just floating along. And Michael, he's, he's putting up all the money, see. <laughs> But really, it, it, they're wonderful cars. They're, they're safer than they were when I was there. Um, you know, with the guys that crash every once in a while, you can see that they, they get up and walk away. And every once in a while, there's a bad wreck. But really, it's just, uh, it's, it's safer today, and it's, <coughs> it's, it's good. Al, if you behave yourself, I'll give you a ride in a two-seater. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he, he asked me if I'd do that, and I told him, I, you know, I've made it this long, and I want to continue <laughs> living. <laughs> he says, me too. I says, I don't believe that. <laughs> well, one of, the, um, one of the terrific things about tonight is that we wanted, uh, obviously, we're all in this room together, but we very much wanted to involve you folks in this discussion. We've got uh, a microphone, I believe, on either side of the room. So it doesn't matter whichever table you're at, just put your hand in the air and, and ask these guys some questions. This is a rare opportunity, a really rare opportunity. And I know that many of you know these gents very well, but uh, take a shot, pop your questions in, and we've got a mic either side. Yep, is there one up the back there, yeah? Okay, yeah, go for it. Hi, uh, Bruce, unbelievable job. I'm kind of in sensory overload that it actually is Mario Andretti, the Michael Jordan of motor racing, and all the others who are Oscar Robertson and Lou Alcindor and you name it, it's unbelievable, thank you. But uh, my question, gentlemen, is how do we get the millennials interested in racing? I mean, I personally think IndyCar, like you say, is more interesting than it's ever been. However, I notice as a marketer that it seems like it's really difficult to get these 35 and unders interested in the sport. Uh, Scott, I'd be particularly curious on your observations on that. And for that matter, even at the museum, hopefully the new museum, as we know, is bringing in some young people like never before. But in general, we worry about are young people really interested in cars and racing? Your thoughts. Thank you. Can you kick it off, Scott? Yeah, it's definitely a, a tough question. Uh, and I'm good at driving, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to that, obviously. But, but you know, I think with, with, you know, what we have today, technology is is the push right and and you know everything is at your hand with you know cell phones or, or you know uh internet and, and so forth so um you know i think getting that connection um you know even with you know kids at the tracks you know i think you know a lot of these events that we still go to we still see very young generations coming uh but it is the key of of you know turning them into avid fans and and uh it is it is tough but i i, I think uh you know that the way that the the Verizon IndyCar series right now is 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 pushing, um, it it uh, is you know is going good in that direction. You know, the TV ratings up. I think you know the interaction with uh, you know the the new app uh, for for the IndyCar series right now is 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 definitely working. Um, but yeah, you know it's always going to take um, you know motivation to work different areas. It's never going to be one thing. You, you you can't always rest on one thing being the cure. Uh, it's going to be a number of different things, and, and uh, you know, I think right now at, at the series, you know, we have good momentum and, and something that we can definitely build on, and, and hopefully we do attract those uh, young fans uh, to the sport, and, and as we had seen, you know, uh, in the past. Anyone else want to jump in, Michael? It's a, it's definitely a problem, and I think there's something that uh, you know, I think not only auto racing, but there's a lot of sports that are really trying to target the millennials and how to get them interested and. You know, I think one thing that does worry me a little bit is, you know, kids today just don't seem to care about automobiles as much as, you know, we all did. And, and so it is a little worrisome, you know, what to do to fix it. Unfortunately, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Um, but I know they're working on things, uh, programs to try to figure out ways to get, you know, the fans more involved, especially the young fan. And, you know, that's what we need to do. You know, somehow, somehow we got to connect our sport to their phone. And I think that's as Scott said, is, <laughs> is what they were doing with the Verizon app and things like that. So I think they're doing a lot of the right things. Yeah. But uh, I think that's going to be the key, you know, to, to do that. I, I think the series is going in the right direction. Uh, there have been, in the recent years, some missteps, unfortunately, that uh, 
uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> it, uh, it took us down, and uh, we were overtaken by the, the NASCAR, which they have taken advantage <clears throat> advantage of that situation. And uh, but I think uh, the biggest thing that uh, the biggest value that that we have is what we've been talking about is the product, and uh, and it's to be able to showcase and brag about what we have because we have a lot. I mean, it's not just Indianapolis, it's the series itself, which was built because of Indianapolis. Indianapolis is a race that started at the beginning of the last century, and then because there were so many cars that were competing there, they figured, what the heck do we do with these cars? So they started uh, taking them to uh, horse tracks, half mile tracks, and, and, uh, and mile dirt tracks, and that's how a series began. So, uh, and again, so now I think we celebrating even not just Indianapolis, but the series itself, because that's, that's what completes the cycle. And, and again, we have a lot to brag about, quite honestly. And I think it's time to start screaming about it mm -hmm. because uh, there's a lot of pride that goes on here and we have, and it's all justified, uh, you know. So it's again, uh, uh, Stay the course and keep building, and and let's not try to make any s backward steps. That's that's going to be, I think, uh, our goal should be the goal for the series as we go forward. But uh, I think uh, the series has momentum now. I just feel it. There's good management in place, and so on and so forth. And and then it needs to have that stability to build on, because again, and just keep talking. I mean, uh, uh, have. Uh, situation where uh, we have in our own way so we can promote it properly you know that's that's really what, what it takes but uh, uh, if we didn't have the product we would have nothing but we have that and that's the essential absolutely that's important and Al for you at the at the UNSA museum and the school and stuff what do you see from the the next generations what do you see from the youngsters are they showing an interest and do they ask questions and are they intrigued what, what's your observation well, I think that that the younger generation today ask a lot of questions about racing, and I think that that being able to, I have, we Sue and I we have a museum in Albuquerque as you just said, and and we have uh, probably ten to fifteen thousand kids that come through every year, and they want to know how they get started in racing, and it's a you know it's a deep subject trying to be able to talk to them, but it. It's something that I enjoy doing of, of telling them how I got started and how things went. And education towards kids is very important in automotive world because if they're not going to be able to be race car drivers, they still have to go out and drive on the streets. And it's very important how you talk to them and how you handle it, I think. And we, and we have a good relation between us about being able to say what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and it's a good challenge too, not only for, for the Verizon IndyCar series. Next question, which side of the room? Is it one up the back there? Oh, over here, yep, go for it. Uh, my question, um, I'm sitting in front of this 1957 Ferrari, which is stunning, and as you gentlemen know a little bit about cars, I'd love to ask each of you, if there is a fancy car of this type as opposed to the Indy car, what would that be for each of you? <laughs> uh, um, what kind of car, what would be your car to be? Yeah, just what, what kind of fancy car would you like? Fancy car, fancy car? I don't yeah. know, I have the best Something car. Something with a steering wheel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a free car, it's a Chevy Tahoe, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> You know, you know, uh, there's uh, many times you get uh, you get asked the question, "What would your dream car be like?" I don't care as long as I could win with a darn thing. <laughs> you know, I just uh, I'm not a designer. And yeah, you know, to your eye, some cars obviously look better than others. But uh, from our standpoint, as long as you have something that's faster than his, right? You know, <laughs> then it looks really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Good answer. For you, Michael? Same so, thing. Same really. thing. I mean, yeah. yeah, I really don't have, but but he's right. You know, I mean, you want to have the better car that 
than the guy next to you, you know, especially as a driver, obviously. And, uh, yeah, so I agree with that answer. But are you talking about straight car or race car? You're talking about race car, aren't you? Uh, Weren't yeah, you, no, didn't race race you race street car or race car? Street car. Let's oh, sorry. Going car, back wow. on the street car, the, a fancy street car. Oh, gosh. I mean, there's so many yeah, out no, there now. It's just... Uh, just a matter of treating yourself, you know, like uh, there's so much choice out there. Uh, nowadays, in fact, I mean, it's eye candy, no matter, you know, you go to an auto show, what's available today, um, they're just uh, amazing, you know, just uh, used to be just a Ferrari. Now, you know, the Ferrari has challenges, you know. Like, would you ever be and seen in an orange Lamborghini, Mario? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Michael? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. Like Dad said, uh, you know, it's fun when you go to a, a car show, and it's like every manufacturer has at least one car that you think is really cool. You know, I think it's, uh, um, you know, I don't know for myself personally. I mean, I do like Lamborghinis, and I, I do like his orange Lamborghini, Lamborghini but, um, you know, I don't really have a dream car, though. Al, what's your fancy street car that would grab your attention and you'd like? Really, if I had a good street car, if it went fast enough, I was put in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so really, I don't, I don't really have a favorite street car. I have, you know, it, it's one I'll of those deals truck. that if you get one, if you want another one, and if you get that one, you still want a faster one. And uh, I, I've never had a favorite one as long as it. I can afford gas and oil. I was all right, I guess. <laughs> Are you sticking with the Chevy Tahoe? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little tight with the cash, so the, the, <laughs> the, the Chevy Tahoe works well for me. It, it's a little angry on the gas mileage, but, but it's, uh, apart from that, it's pretty good. Because we know that 500, you know, that prize pool is, you know, just shrinking, isn't it? <laughs> all right, next question. Good question. Thanks for that. Yes, sir. Hi. Good evening. Uh, I just wanted to say in 1974, I was a senior in high school and I had to write an English paper to graduate and I wrote it about Mario Andretti. And I sent him a list of questions and he responded and he sent a sticker along with it which is still on my toolbox. <laughs> and I think we're here not just because you're all great drivers but you're role models or you've made a real impact in our lives and I just wanted to Thank you all for it. Thank you. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel very, very good indeed. Uh, and uh, we do get uh, requests and so forth, uh, especially from students. And, um, and I welcome that so much, you know, being a big, for many reasons. Obviously, uh, uh, anyone interested in our sport, but also, uh, here's young lads that um, are interested in something specifically, and um, and again, you know, this is uh, it's wonderful to hear that um, uh, someone actually enjoyed. Did you get did you get an A plus? <laughs> uh, very good. Next question. A little bit hard to see. Go for it, Chip. Chip Ganassi. Chip's question, he just or request, he said he wants each of the drivers to pick a race that they won, any race that they choose that they won, just to talk about it. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> it has to do with Chip because uh, coming back uh, when I had my stint in Formula One, which didn't go very well, um, you know, Chip gave me the chance to come back to IndyCar and uh, and we went out and won our very first race together. So that that was a real special day for me uh, back in Australia. Australia, 1994, 94, right? right yeah. in the Service Paradise, 94. <laughs> Al, pick a race, any race. Well, I guess I can, you know, say the last one, because uh, the last Indy I won there, it was circumstances. I went back there without a ride, because I wasn't happy with everything that I was offered. And then Penske offered me a ride over, the, you know, the way it turned out. I end up winning the race, thanks to Mario getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> You're up next. <laughs> You're welcome. 
<laughs> but anyway, you know, you, you, you don't think you have a chance to run up, you know, you, you have a chance to run up front, but you're not sure whether you can run with the leaders. And then all of a sudden, you are there, and then it turns out that you end up winning the race. And it's just a fantastic deal, you know, even, even you know, you can say what you want about, well, it was given to you or it wasn't. There was a lot of them that we can all sit up here and say, I should have, but you didn't. You have to get the checkered flag. And it, it's, a, it's a, any race we used to run, it's a hard deal to get that checkered flag. And to get it, it makes you very warm and, and humble, I think. Maria? Well, <clears throat> I can stay local uh, here in Long Beach. Um, I think in 77, um, uh, the Formula One race here, um, I dogged uh, Jody Schechter for um, the best part of the race, you know, just uh, he's leading, obviously, I'm second. And uh, I had to try to figure out, and on the last lap, you know, I got him, uh, you know, just with a Hail Mary pass, you know, at the end of uh, uh, Lake Shore, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the sh uh, Shoreline. Shoreline, yeah, Shoreline straight. Um, and, you know, I thought that was extremely satisfying. And, uh, of course, we're going to Long Beach this weekend, so... Um, um, this is another great event, incredible event that uh, has been a real marquee for, for the IndyCar series uh, since uh, its inception, you know, and it's, uh, it's got a good, strong, long life, and, and it's a perfect example of what uh, our sport has done actually to that community, to that city. Um, you know, uh, I'm one of the guys that were, was there at the very beginning in 1975 at the very first race and uh, and the city of Long Beach was not thriving at the time by any means and uh, the way it transformed through the the, the, uh, uh, the exposure that it got uh, internationally you know through our sport and uh, and we're obviously the Indy cars uh, have become you know the marquee event for yeah. them it's for good for us and good for them uh, and at the same time and it continues to be uh, very, very strong, and everybody wants to be there. It's not just a race, it's the event. It's a strong event. And I think that the long-time promoter, Jim McKaylian, is here tonight. So a round of applause for Jim and the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. <laughs> Incidentally, you can watch that at 4 p.m. Eastern on your home of Motorsport NBCSN this Sunday. Just thought I'd get that in there. My boss is here tonight, so I had to. Our most, the most recent winner of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, Scott Dixon, what was it? Was it that? Was that your favourite race? Or just, Chip just said, pick any race. Pick a race that, that really stands out for you. Yeah, I think there's, there's always so many that, that, uh, that you remember for different reasons. You know, your first IndyCar win or, you know, 500 or, or whatever it was. But uh, I don't know. I, I think definitely one of the sweetest was, was probably Sonoma last year. Uh, what we had to do as a team to, you know, we started ninth and, and, you know, two or three of the competitors for the championship were ahead of us on the grid and, and what we pulled off as a team last year to, to snatch that championship and the victory at Sonoma, um, that, one's, that one's pretty tough to beat. And who could forget Chip crowd surfing? That's right. <laughs> that was pretty spectacular. <laughs> Very good. Next question. It's a little bit difficult to see. Hello. Yes, Doug Feehan. Oh, oh, sorry, I can see up there with the microphone. Go for it. Uh, first of all, as a fan, I'd like to thank all of the drivers in the room for hours and hours and days and days and months and months of exciting times as a fan. What I'm curious about, we've talked about Indy and asphalt, asphalt, asphalt. I know Mario has a background on dirt and Al has a background on dirt, uh, Langhorn Speedway, uh, Trenton when it was dirt. I'd like to hear a little bit about what it was like going sideways at 100 miles an hour and what was going on and obviously, you know, you knew why you were there, but to me that was the most exciting racing, the old champ cars and stuff like that. Hey, <coughs> amen. <laughs> no question. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it was wonderful when the, uh, the, Indy, the championship uh, and the Indy cars actually uh, had both uh, road racing and oval pavement and the dirt cars. And in fact, uh, in in '69, 
uh, for that championship, uh, you know, I, w I won uh, on the road course, I won on the dirt, I won on a, you know, on an oval, and I also won Pikes Peak. Uh, Pikes Peak used to count for the uh, national championship points. You know, so and you look back and you figure how blessed I was to have those opportunities, you know. And uh, even, even when I was already in Formula One, I, was, I would go like uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from Argentina to Ducoin, Illinois type of thing, you know, on the dirt. It was, uh, you know, it was incredible. Uh, uh, when <coughs> uh, the Questro Grand Prix was a Formula One race and, and, and the, uh, the Formula 5000 at, at, at uh, Ontario here, uh, Indy cars had a race on a Saturday in Phoenix. So we qualified here on a Friday and go race in Phoenix on Saturday, come back here at Ontario and won both races, you know, for Ferrari there. So, you know, when you look back at those opportunities to have something so diverse, you know, just even on the same weekend, and have a championship that uh, you have to obviously be able to operate with something, you know, so different, you know, from a front engine to rear engine car. Um, yeah, that was, um, that was a great moment. But, you know, that uh, there was really no real life, you know, in, in uh, no real future for the dirt car races, unfortunately, because, you know, technology, one thing, another. I mean, it's still there, it's still very important, but uh, not at this level, unfortunately. Al, anything to add on that? Well, I think, the, you know, the, the way the championship trail used to be, as Mario says, it was very interesting. You know, you had, if you showed up at a dirt race, wherever it was at, at whatever fairgrounds, you had 20 minutes to get that car working, 20 minutes of practice. I mean, it was the same for everybody, but then, you know, you, the Indy cars were the same way. You didn't have a two or three days or a day of practice to get your car working. You had to be on top of it, and you had to trust your mechanics that you had and the decisions that you told them what the car was doing in 15, 20 minutes better be right. So you had your work cut out for you, huh, Mario? I mean, it. Yeah, but it, the reason for that is because the track could only last for that long. You know, the, <laughs> the conditions would change so dramatically. And uh, so that was the nature of the beast. You know, it just, uh, you can just keep running and running and running on the dirt. You know, you prepare it, you, uh, you know, you disc it. And then, then you got to go, you know. So, but uh, yeah, everything was just one day, yeah, for sure. You yeah, know, you I practice, you qualify, enjoy the then you race. race. Kind of <laughs> yeah, when you're sideways and you look at that fence and you say, "Boy, I sure hope I stop before I hit it." <laughs> Doug, what was your question? I know I don't need a mic. <clears throat> Mario, this question is for you. I'm going to take you back to maybe about 1967, 1968, you were running uh, Grand, USAC Grand National Stock Cars. And uh, you were part of a two-car team. Uh, second car uh, driven by a, a name I think that everybody's reasonably familiar with. But I wonder if you could share with us just one or two memories of, of what that was like working with that man on that team and the things that you guys accomplished. Are you talking about Foyt when we had, or he and I were together, yeah. or, or, or Foyt Parnelli? And Bell. Val Parnelli. Oh, Val. I mean, uh, actually, you know, there was a couple of the races that uh, was we were teammates, you know, with, with Parnelli, but he always had a bigger engine in his car. <laughs> <laughs> he was number one on that team. Yeah. And he deserved it, too. A <laughs> couple, of, couple of last questions. Yep. Parnelli's my hero. Um, I'm not going to use the M word like my marketing friend over there, but I am young. There are other young people in the room who, like myself, are very much into driving, not just cars and that they're beautiful and that they're fun and that they're fast, but the act of driving. So for you guys, what was it that was so seductive about racing, not just driving? And for you, is it you know, the technical side of racing or the emotional side of racing? that really drew you into a life of, uh, of going
fast. Michael, why don't, and can I add on to your question? Michael, why don't you answer that first? And obviously, <laughs> there was a very heavy influence, but was it more than just to follow your dad's footsteps and to be like your dad? Was there something more? Was there something extra seductive about cars and racing and going fast other than yeah. the dad impact? Yeah, there definitely was. You know, I think, uh, I think you know, we... I started out very young. I was like nine years old racing go-karts and, and it's just, I think once you start doing it and you, once you start getting the control of the vehicle and then you start finding out that you can push it to different limits and, and then you start getting into the technical side of there's things you can do on, to the car to make it better and you know, those are the things that really got me interested in and really wanted to go and, and push hard for it. And, and uh, you know, that's one thing I, I was very fortunate, you know, that and I was, I came into Indy cars when it was really getting to that point where technology was really taking off, carbon fiber cars were coming in and blah, blah, blah. And, and it was really cool to live through that and, you know, to look forward to the next car that was coming out and the next big thing that they, they came out with to make it faster and stuff. So th those were things that I loved about, you know, driving, you know, having that, you know, and always um, having something new and different. Um, but also I think driving, too, there's that satisfaction that you get when you put that perfect lap together or when you do that race that you know you just you couldn't have done it any better uh, there is just no better feeling in the world Scott for you yeah, I think Michael touched on a lot of it but yeah th you know I was seven I think when I first had to go on a go-kart and it was it was uh, the best feeling on earth and I think that you know through all categories you know whenever you moved up you know from you know go-karts to juniors to you know smaller formulas the first 10 laps in a, in a, in a bigger car were the, the craziest, most fun you could, you could possibly have. You know, just, you were kind of holding on, you, know, you had more power, the things were moving faster. It, you know, it took you a little while to, to adapt to it. But uh, for me, you know, it's, it's competition too. Um, that's, that's what really, you know, I think drives myself and, and you know, everybody at the team. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to win and by, by all extents, it's, it's extremely tough. So when you do, you know, the feeling of, of beating you know, the competition that's out there right now, it's, it's, uh, there's no better feeling than that. Al? Well, that's true, you, you know, what you say is kind of, it, it racing is a, uh, another aspect of, I guess, they called us all crazy, but, you know, it, we love it, uh, it's just a great, great deal. Mario? Well, I, again, uh, they touched off, and it, you know, pretty much uh, uh, all the areas where um, you maintain motivation because you look forward to just the next challenge as a driver. But also, uh, you know, from my standpoint, I could hardly wait for the new car, for right. new innovations. Um, you know, it was just like an expecting father, you know, like even every year, a new car coming. Now. Uh, that car sometimes uh, had one leg shorter than the other and cross eyes, <laughs> you know, but you were still looking forward to something different, something potentially better, you know, so, uh, but it's, it's a complex of things, you know, it's, uh, it's that emotional side, of course, the satisfaction of uh, having control of uh, a beast, actually, something that can actually hurt you, but having full control of it. And, uh, and, um, and don't, don't let it beat you. And then the other side is, what's the next beast gonna be like? Is it gonna be more ferocious? You know, you want it to be more ferocious, you know? And uh, so that, these are all the things that keep you motivated. And then we got, I, I see you there. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment. Yes, up there, go for it. Last two questions. Um, it is indeed an honor. Uh, to speak with you guys, well, who, know, who knew so many men were interested in racing. I've been a racing fan since the 60s, and it seems like the cars are getting more technical and they get away from just who's the best driver. I heard that Michelin has a tire that they claim will last the entire race, so I just wanna know um, what do you, at least with Formula One, even though they went with Pirelli again, but I wanna know what you feel, how you feel about a tire that could last an entire race, so we could get back to who times the pit um, in, in terms of strategies of winning and, and get back to who's the best driver? Well, I don't know. I mean, 
I think the tires are interesting. I think that's one thing that, uh, you know, IndyCar has been lucky to have a partner of Firestone, and, and uh, I think they're the best tires that, you know, we've ever had. Uh, I know in my career when we got Firestone that the, the quality of every tire is just top notch. So um, that's good. But uh, one thing that I think uh, because of the technology of tires is that um, they can make tires that last forever. Um, but that's actually not good for racing. You know, I think it's important uh, to have tires that go away and that if you don't set your car up in the right way, it'll make it worse, which then makes it better for the guy that did a better job and set his car up, and then you'll have passing in the race. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing that, you know, uh, Firestone does with uh, the two, on the road courses, when we have the two compounds, we have a hard one and a soft one, and the soft one only lasts so long, and then it goes off, and so there's a strategy there, and I think that's really good for the show, and I think that that's one, uh, one thing that they came up with a few years ago that I think has really worked. Yes, sir. You got the mic? Is the microphone I've down got, here? I've got the mic here. Oh, you got the I mic? just want to thank you, Lee. Oh. This has been absolutely an epic night. And I think all of us have witnessed something that may you'll never see again. This was just so special here at the Peterson. And what I was going to ask is all the winners could come up to the stage. We could do a group shot, if that's OK, that are sitting here. So you can give them a, a special treat. So you get your photos, your cameras out, your iPhones, and we'll get a group shot. And, and Lee, you just, you're the best. Thank you. I'll get beside this guy. It's Kieran here from Belkin. We need you up here right now.
we have an award ceremony, and if you just stick around for a moment. Well, folks, now I'd like you, um, I'd like to welcome Mark Miles, the CEO of Holman & Co, IndyCar's parent company, because for our four legends, Scott, don't go anywhere. Mario's still here. Keep Al there. And Michael's still up here. Mark, if you would. Thanks, Lee. Everybody, we're uh, going to wrap up here by making some uh, presentations quickly. Scott, Mario. Scott, we need you back up here. Chip, Chip, we need you to body surf, please. <laughs> so uh, this was called an epic season a few times tonight. For me, it started, it's been an epic day. We went from LAX to uh, Dan Gurney's 85th birthday, and that was an epic event to see him and, and, and hear him telling his stories. And then to be here, I just want to say to Bruce and Tim, where are you? This, uh, this place is just perfect for this Legends evening. There you are. It's, it's just blown us away. We can't wait to bring friends back to work more closely together in the future between Indianapolis and here. Thank you very much for your hospitality. It's a great place. Uh, this was called an epic season for lots of reasons, but basically because we thought it was a way to talk about how the DNA of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the Indianapolis 500 is infused through the whole of the Verizon IndyCar series. And there is no better example of that than the Toyota Long Beach Grand Prix, wherever Jim is, if he's still here. Uh, epic event and a, a, a perfect example of what we mean by an epic season. And Indianapolis is coming. And uh, I can tell you that every one of you is going to be proud of that event in May. It is going to be sold out, and that hasn't happened since 1995. And we think it's going to be a phenomenal race. I uh, can't wait for that to happen. Over here, we have, are these, we have some, uh, a remembrance of tonight. And the first goes to Scott Dixon. Scott? Al, you're next. And Michael, we love you. And Mario. Mark, thank you very much, and, and most importantly, folks, thank you very much for coming along tonight. Um, we've all, uh, you know, as IndyCar, people involved in the industry, whether you're fans, observers, whatever it might be, we've got to embrace moments like these. We've got to remember our legends. We've done that tonight. Look forward to the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500 more immediately this weekend, the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Tell your friends, tell people who don't know, IndyCar legends, great people, great role models, the sport is moving upwardly in a very quickly, uh, very quick fashion as we've discussed tonight. There's a lot to celebrate about the Verizon IndyCar series and please one more time, thank, congratulate and we honour our IndyCar legends. Thank you and good night.